Welcome to our, our latest Sunrise session. My name is Mark McClellan, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Dean of Graduate Studies at USU. As a parent of six children, I know what it's like to, to be on those sidelines, to have all that emotional energy tied up inside me as I watched my children play. And of course, we've all just come off the Olympics, an incredible experience. And, and a fun opportunity to not only watch how the athletes behave, but how the parents behave, too. It's an amazing uh, array. And, and through all the stories that happened during those two weeks of the Olympics, uh, uh, the ups and downs, the positives and negatives, I, I did have a funny feeling. I wonder how their parents felt. And we're very fortunate today to have Travis Dorsch here to speak about this subject. Travis is an assistant professor in family, consumer, and human development. But along with his research, Dr. Dorsch is going to be sharing some of his strategies of, that he employs in terms of his uh, sports leagues, working with administrators and parents in terms of cultivating an appropriate environment. So please join me in welcoming Travis Dorsch to the stage. Well, thank you everybody for being here so early, especially those that drove down from, from up north. I know it's an early morning. I'm really honored to be here with you today. And as, as Mark mentioned, uh, my name is Travis Dorsch. I'm an assistant professor at Utah State and the founding director of the Families and Sport Lab there on campus. For as long as I can remember, my life has been about sports. As a youth, I participated in football, basketball, baseball, and soccer. In high school, I added track and field to the mix. I was recruited to play football and baseball at Purdue University, where I competed in both sports for four years. And upon graduating from Purdue, I was fortunate enough to be drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in the fourth round of the NFL draft. Now, I share all this because I feel like I have an intimate knowledge of every level of organized sport, from youth development all the way through elite participation. And this combined with my academic expertise in family relationships, in parent-child relationships, and in the understanding of how those work together in sport provides me really a unique lens, I feel, for talking about the positives and the negatives that can stem from organized sport participation. Now, youth sport really does have the potential, and I use that word this morning quite on purpose, the potential to offer so many positives, as you can see behind me, to the youth who participate. But I think one problem that we have as adults, namely parents, is that we think of sport as this perfect little black box where we put our kids in, they participate, and out they come on the other side as better people and better athletes. I'm here to tell you this morning that that's just not the case. Sport in and of itself is really a neutral context. Sport, as we think about it, to come up with all these positive outcomes is really driven by adults. And that's the catch-22 that we're gonna spend some time on this morning. You see, it's up to us as adults to create the kind of context that elicit these positive outcomes, parents, coaches, administrators. This morning, I'd like to spend time in my wheelhouse, my area of expertise, and that is on parent engagement in organized sport. Now, before we get going too far, I'd like to talk about the reasons why children participate. Why is it that young people get engaged in sport in the first place? Well, we've actually asked them that very simple question. And when we do, they give us three primary reasons. First and foremost, they want to have something that they're good at, right? We all want to be, I want to be a great speaker today. You guys, when you head off to your jobs, want to be great work, workmen, workwomen. Okay? You want to be great parents and spouses and partners and friends. Children are no different. They want to feel physically competent in a setting that they can take ownership of. Secondly, children play sports because they want to make friends, because their friends are doing it, right? It's that social affiliation. It's the reason that we as adults maybe go for a walk in the morning or a jog with some friends on our lunch hour. We all want to have social affiliation in what we do. We want to feel connected like we're pulling the rope in the same direction as our peers. And finally, and it's just this simple, kids want to have fun. Now, when I give this spiel to parents, oftentimes, you know, you'll have the parents in the back and they're saying, well, yeah, fun, I, I get it, right? But fun's not the most important thing. And believe me, I participated, as I mentioned, across the spectrum of sports. And I understand that our goals become more nuanced and more competitive over time. But having said that, if you think about the best of the best, the elite athletes that are out there, they're also competing for fun. In fact, I'll share with you this morning a video 
And she's very driven. She's very focused. But she likes to have fun. If she goes in and she's looking serious, <laughs> it's not going to be a good meet. But if my daughter is acting silly, if she's giggly, she's going to have a good meet. And I think that's so true for a lot of Olympians. There are numerous examples. We saw Michael Phelps talk about how he recentered himself after his issues of four years ago in competing uh, in London, how he was just out to have fun. We saw Katie Ledecky talk about it in the swimming pool, how she just wants to have fun and compete against herself. So elite athletes, and I use these Olympic examples because it's at the forefront of our mind, these elite athletes want to have fun. Having said all that, what's the flip side of the coin? Why do children drop out of sport? I think this is an important conversation to have as well. And again, they give us three primary reasons. First and foremost, and I'm going to pin this on you as coaches and parents, an overemphasis on winning, especially at those early ages. Parental pressure, which we're going to talk about uh, throughout the remainder of the talk today. And then finally, a lack of time, right? As you think about young people who are now engaging uh, more heavily in their schoolwork, are finding other extracurriculars, have more friends in a social life, the calendar shrinks a little bit. So for these three reasons, children are dropping out of sports. And, and in the United States, that's happening largely between the ages of 11 and 13. And I view this as a very critical time period. Why? Because during this time period, our young people are developing socially, emotionally, cognitively, and physically. And in light of the emerging childhood and adolescent obesity epidemic in our country, I think it's a very sad thing that our children are feeling the need to drop out of sports at 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. At the very time, they should be creating lifelong habits and a love of exercise and physical activity. So when we look at these side by side, I think it's really very clear, at least it is in my eyes, and maybe I'm biased, but what I see here on the left, why children participate, these are reasons that are internal to the child. Okay? Children, they want to have fun, they want to make friends, they want to feel good at something, internal. Versus on the right, you see, why do they drop out? These are things that are more external in nature. It harkens back to what I said earlier about the kind of context that we're creating as adults, parents, coaches, administrators. So in light of this, I think it's really important that we examine some of these external reasons why children are dropping out of sports uh, at this very critical time period. And when we do so, one thing that comes to mind immediately, and, and we've, we've uh, begun some research in this area, is how parents are communicating, either directly with, with words and actions or indirectly with their children, the kind of values that they're creating related to organized youth sport. So we're going to talk a little bit about parent-child communication and its impact on the outcome uh, of youth experiences. Now, <clears throat> as an object lesson, let me ask you guys. You have a child, let's say they're playing a basketball game. They come back, you missed the game, you're in the kitchen waiting. They come in the garage, walk through the mudroom, drop off all their gear. Uh, and, and what's the first question that you would likely ask them? Did you win, right? That's, I, I, I get it every time. Someone's going to stump me someday. Did you win, right? And that might be followed up by questions like, how much did you play? There you go. You guys are good. Do you need me at all? Here we <laughs> and how many points did you score? Okay. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with these questions. We're interested in our child's experience, right? But you see, what we communicate, what we communicate when we ask these questions is that success equals beating someone. That success equals playing instead of someone. And that success equals scoring or accumulating statistics higher than someone else. Again, that external focus. What if instead we focused on questions like, what did you have fun doing today? What did you do well? Or what did you learn? You see, inherent in these questions are a different set of goals, the goals that should be and probably are important to the young people whom you're talking with. More importantly, it gives ownership of that experience, of that sport experience to your child, and also time to reflect on that experience. Because, you see, these questions, unlike the previous three, can't be answered with one word, or one sentence, but they engage in a reciprocal back and forth where that child can then own the experience and talk to his or her parent about it. Now, oftentimes I get to this point in my spiel and I have, you know, the parent in the back that's got his arms crossed and is looking kind of smug and, well, yeah, that's, that's great. You've taken away my whole vocab, right? <laughs> how, how am I going to talk to my kids now? 
you know, and one thing when I draw on the, on the human development, the family literature, and I think about what's a great place to start in every parent-child relationship, I tell parents to say the five simple words. I love watching you play. You see, inherent in that message is an even more important message, right? That it's about the child, that you're there to support the child, and that you love the child, win, lose, or draw. I love watching you play. Five words, but a very powerful message. So in light of this, in light of our uh, role, yeah, in light of our role as teaching parents or giving parents better strategies to communicate with their kids, I see the, the, the glossiness in the parents' eyes and they look at me like I'm speaking from an ivory tower or from like the A clock tower on campus at Utah State. And they say, well, this is great, but how then should I communicate with my kids? And sometimes I find the best way to teach or instruct is through a negative example. And what we did in our lab a couple of years ago, in 2014, we, we began the uh, Encourage, Enhance, and Inspire campaign, which was a series of three public service announcements really directed at parents and really targeted at getting parents to ask themselves the very important rhetorical question of, if I wouldn't act like this at a spelling bee, if I wouldn't act like this when my kid's taking a math test, if I wouldn't act like this when my kid is in the middle uh, of an exam at school, Okay, or a band recital. Why then would I act like this on the sidelines? Okay, so let's watch this and we can discuss at the end. Your word is delegate. D-E-L-E-G-A-T-E, -E, delegate. Irate. I-R-A-T-E, irate. Responsible. S-P-O-N-S-I-B-L-E. Responsible. Immature. I-M-M-A-T-U-R-E. Would you spell the word respect? Respect. R-E-S-P-E-K-T. Oh, what? Come on! Can't believe this. All this practice. No, Steve. The word is R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Thank you. I can't believe this. Respect? You misspelled respect? It's like the song. R-E-S-P-E-C-T? I can't believe this. So it draws some chuckles, yeah? And I, I think that's, that's a good thing because we all look at that and we say, that would never happen, right? But in my experience, I go to a youth soccer field on a Saturday afternoon and I see that conversation taking place as the kids and parents walk back to the minivan of the Suburban after the game. So I ask you guys today, why does it happen in organized youth sport when it doesn't happen in these other developmental settings? And one of the answers that I come up with or one of the, one of the hypotheses I have is that it has to do with this idea of the professionalization of youth sport. You see, we're now forcing parents to spend more and more and more just so their children can keep up with the Joneses and maybe even make the high school team, right? Well, we wanted to test this empirically because largely, you know, the idea of crazy parents is something that's grounded in this caricature of Western culture. So we wanted to examine whether or not family financial investment impacted parent involvement behaviors and children's sport outcomes. Now, we went into this a bit naive. It was exploratory in nature, and we thought, you know, excuse my lack of scientific knowledge here, but we thought rich kids, they'll have all the fun, right? They'll have the best coaches. They'll travel the farthest to play the best teams. They'll have the best equipment, the best off-season trainers. In short, they'll have the best experiences and the best chance to arrive at that elite level. What we found surprised us, and maybe it shouldn't have, but as families began to spend more, as a proportion of their gross annual income. Okay. Children actually sensed or felt more parental pressure. And as those children felt more parental pressure, their enjoyment and subsequently their commitment to continue participating went down. So as you can see here, there's really an indirect outcome where spending more money on the part of parents and families leads to children not enjoying sport as much and wanting to drop out sooner. The exact opposite, I'm sure, of what all parents expect and want. Okay. Now the key here, the real kicker, is that when we controlled for perceived parental pressure, okay, 
there was no effect. In other words, it's not how much you spend. Okay, it's not how much parents are spending, but rather it's the emotions that, that the child feels because of that spending that are important. So I challenge parents, and I'll challenge you today in the audience to think about when you slide that money across the table for the travel ball team or for the camp or for the lessons or for the equipment, how are you then interacting with your child because of that? Is there some sort of expectation of a return on that investment? Okay. The example I like to give here is one of an investment banker. If I put that $10,000 on the table in 2016 and I go visit that, that individual 10 years down the road, I expect there's going to be more than that original pot of money, right? I expect money in return. That's not how youth sports operate. In fact, for the majority of families, that money is gone. So what are your children getting from it? Instead, I like to think about youth sport as a family vacation or maybe a trip to Disneyland. Okay. Let's say we're going to Disneyland, a family of four. We're going to drop $1,000 on airfare, another 1000 on a hotel, lodging, another 1000 for tickets and food and entertainment while we're there. This is becoming a pricey vacation, right? But at the end of it, we don't expect to bring Mickey Mouse home. We don't expect to set up Magic Mountain in our backyard, right? There's no expectation of a return on that investment other than the fun in the moment, the enrichment of the family experience during that week-long vacation. And youth spor sports are very much the same. Youth sports are an opportunity to engage young people in a developmental context, as I said earlier, that has the potential to create a lot of positive outcomes in the present and the future. And as parents, I think we can do a better job of creating that. Now, this work was featured in the Wall Street Journal about a year ago, and I think it's really caused uh, a stir in multiple youth sport communities as parents really try and reconcile what is the right number to be spending on my kids' sports. And I get that question all the time, whether from reporters or parents. You know, how much should I be spending? Well, I, I can't stand up here today and say $3,462.73 is the cutoff, that your kids would be great below that and, and they'll, you know, they'll, be, they'll have bad outcomes after that. It just doesn't work that way. Again, the key component here is how are parents treating that, I'll use, I'll use air quotes, investment. What are their behavioral interactions with their kids because of the investment? Are we having conversations like, I, I dropped $5,000 for you to play on this team, you better be a starter. Well, now we can sense why kids feel pressure, right? I ask myself this question as I, I ponder my own line of research a lot, and I say, w why are we where we are? Why do parents and, and really society at a broader level, why do we feel like it's our only goal to create successful and high-achieving children? And I think it's because in the pop culture and the pop literature, there are so many people telling us how to parent, how to create champions of our children. That's probably a book title somewhere, okay? But we see examples out there in the pop literature, that if your child subscribes to this diet and this weight training regimen, that you can unlock the secret gene to unleash their athletic success. That if they get just 10,000 hours of dedicated practice during their childhood, they'll become an expert in their domain. Okay. You see, the problem with this is that it teaches parents okay, that success is all about, as I said earlier, beating someone, or winning, or scoring more, or getting that college scholarship. So until we can redefine what success is, I think we're going to be mired in this race to the top, this race to create champions of our children, rather than to give them a childhood that will allow them themselves to make themselves champions down the road in life. Now, as we reflect on the scientific literature in this area, it becomes evident that there's really three distinct uh, stages, if you will, of sport participation. And those stages are very important developmentally because children need to progress through those stages sequentially to arrive at a good place on the back end of their sport participation. Now, the first stage is sampling. In the sampling stage, typically occurring between the ages of, say, 5 or 6 to 11 or 12, children are doing just that, sampling a number of different sports. Okay? They might be playing sports that last five or six weeks, taking a few weeks off and trying something new. Again, it's an exploratory phase of sport participation that I think all young people uh, go through early on, right? Where you move from soccer to baseball to tennis to basketball to swimming lessons, and it's this never-ending cycle where parents want to pull their hair out, right? But sampling is very important, and when I get to the next stage, you'll see why. But during this sampling stage, parents should really be focusing on providing broad support, financial, emotional, support for their children as they participate. Now in the second stage, the, uh, the specialization stage, excuse me, 
Children are now beginning uh, to learn during puberty and during that transition to high school what they're good at and what they love. Two very important lessons in sport. And as they learn those lessons, they begin to pare down the sports they're participating in, maybe taking it from three, four, five, or even six sports down to kind of their two or three favorite sports. Now, the key during this stage is that parents are able and have the self-discipline to take a back seat now to their children as their children develop their own goals, as their children learn what they love and what they're good at and set goals for themselves to achieve, all the while remaining supportive in nature, supportive both of the children as well as the coaches who the children are now turning to for more advice. And the final stage, which not all children actually get to, based on what I said earlier about children dropping out at that, uh, at that pubertal entry, 12, 13, 14 years old, the investment stage. Now, during the investment stage, young people, as they transition into late high school and even into college or as, as elite Olympians or professionals, really begin to focus on normally one but potentially two sports that they are participating in year-round. Their goal is obviously talent development. Their goal is competition. Okay? But as I said earlier, their goal still remains to have fun. Now, a tip for parents here is really to take even further a back seat, really to allow that child to engage with their coach and their teammates to set the course and direction for their own participation. And I think, I, I know we have a, a few NCAA folks uh, in attendance today, and I think this is where sometimes parents of NCAA or maybe even Olympic athletes get into trouble with their kids is they're not six anymore, right? They're, in many cases, grown adults who have a plan and a trajectory for their own sport participation. All that being said, parent involvement is still important, and I think that's, that's something important that we'll talk about here in a little bit. All the time, all the while, I get the parent, as I mentioned earlier, in back, arms crossed, smug face, saying, yeah, that's great, you know, but my kid's not the average athlete. My kid's going to be a superstar. Right? You're all laughing because you probably said it. My kid's going to be the next Wayne Gretzky. My kid's going to be the next Tom Brady. They need to play their one sport year-round and become the best at it so they can beat out that kid on the high school team so they can get that college scholarship. Well, Wayne Gretzky's here to tell you today that he played everything early on. In fact, he says, I played lacrosse, baseball, hockey, soccer, track. I was a big believer that you played hockey in the winter, and when the season was over, you hung up your skates and you played something else. Tom Brady, perhaps the greatest quarterback, at least of our generation, uh, maybe even of history, su recent suspension notwithstanding, okay? He says, expose your kids to different sports. It was basketball when it was basketball season, baseball when it was baseball season. I didn't play football until I was a freshman in high school. I just played in the neighborhood with all the kids that we grew up with. So you can see the emergence here of a theme, okay? This idea that early specialization isn't necessarily the path to athletic success, the path to the college scholarship, the path to becoming an Olympian. Now, save a few sports where uh, the height of one's career does come at or just after puberty, like gymnastics, like figure skating, potentially like swimming, okay? There are some examples where early specialization is necessary, but for all of us in here and for all the kids out there in the soccer fields in Salt Lake City and up north in Logan, that's typically not the case. If you don't believe me yet, this is a chart crafted by Urban Meyer. Now, many of you might know the name Urban Meyer. He was, uh, a while back, the head football coach here at the U, is now at Ohio State. And if you look at the pattern of his recruiting in football over the past two years, you can see that 89% of his recruits that have come into his program have been multiple sport high school athletes. So why then would we sit here today or would we go home and talk to our children and talk about son, daughter, you need to choose one sport. You need to play that sport. You need to accumulate those 10,000 hours of practice, and you need to become an expert in that sport. It's just not developmentally the path to success. Now, youth sports is great. Youth sports is ubiquitous. Youth sports is indeed my passion. But the problem with youth sports today, in my opinion, is that many parents, and, and in fact many coaches, view it as simply a vehicle to arrive at a higher point of sport participation, at an elite form of sport participation. Now in the United States, largely that takes the role of earning a college scholarship. That's the gold standard for youth athletes. Right? Now because of this, we've been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years with the NCAA, focusing largely on parents' role in facilitating the transition to college 
for their young student athletes. Now our work really focuses on parents' role. And again, I've talked to some of the athletic directors and some of the other administrators in the audience in, in separate conversations, and we've discussed, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to eliminate parents? But I, I don't think that's the answer. You see, parents have a vital role in helping their young people develop, especially now where we see childhood and adolescence sort of extending longer, right, until some of our young people uh, become emerging adults and on into adulthood and can become self-sufficient. But the student-athlete development is an interesting topic because now, for the first time, student-athletes, young people as they go to college, have to balance sport, academic, and now social activities, all the while being away now from their parents for likely the first time, having to do things like laundry, making food, okay, going to the grocery store, cleaning the house, all the things that likely they didn't have to do growing up, all while performing in front of television sets, sometimes in front of millions of people. Right? Now, parent involvement, as I mentioned earlier, I think is a really integral piece of this puzzle. Okay? Student athletes, in most cases, can't do it without their parents. Okay? But it can also be a potentially problematic aspect of this transition to adulthood. And I'm going to share some data uh, that back up this point. Now, we found in our work with a number of universities, ranging from Division I through Division III, some in the Intermountain West, some in the Midwest, some on the East Coast, that parent involvement in NCAA athletics really breaks down neatly into four separate categories. First and foremost, in the support that parents offer their children. Okay? And support can be defined broadly, and it really is in our research as well. But it can be anything from helping uh, with transportation, getting a car to campus, sending money so the child can make rent, getting food, taking you and teammates out to dinner. Really just broad support. How do we support our young student athletes as parents? Secondly, the contact that we have with our young people as student athletes, whether that be in person, face to face after a game, on social media, a cell phone call, whatever it might be. And then third and fourth, academic and athletic engagement. How do parents insert themselves into okay, the athletic and academic lives of their young people? Now, in these four areas, you might expect that more involvement would be good. We did, right? That the parents who are more involved are going to have you know, adaptive children that are transitioning well because they have that base of support from their parents. Our data tell a bit of a more nuanced story. Okay? And when we look at the outcomes in student-athletes that stem from these four types of parent involvement, we do see a lot of positive benefits. In fact, young student-athletes report academic self-efficacy increasing. In other words, they feel better about their schoolwork, more athletic satisfaction, and less depression, obviously a, a key marker of well-being among student-athletes and something the NCAA is very concerned about. However, we also see some negative outcomes from more parent involvement in these four areas. Namely, less emotional uh, independence, okay, less emotional independence, and less attainment of adult criteria. And see, these are two outcomes that I think we'd all like to see, student athlete or not, in our young people that go off to college. We'd like them to become, sort of in quotes again, more mature, right? But what we're seeing is, is again, a nuanced picture of, we're seeing a lot of positives, but we're seeing young athletes who at the end of their athletic experience maybe aren't as mature as they could have been had their parents left them alone a little bit more. Okay? Now, parents all the time, because of this messy picture I just showed, are asking me, well, how then should we be involved? What's the best way for being involved for me as a parent? We've created really two resources for the NCAA and its member institutions. The first, an administrator manual. The Administrator Manual offers a step-by-step -step for universities to build and craft parent education programs for incoming freshmen. As an example, you can see here that we talk to administrators about some of the external factors they need to think about when they're creating policy. Okay? Factors such as where is the family from, okay? competitiveness of the parents. Did the parent participate in NCAA athletics themselves? Well, that's a different kind of parent than one who never played sports. right? How about student-athlete gender? Is it different for male athletes and female athletes? Okay. 
parenting culture? What kind of culture is imbued in the parents at that institution? These are all things that administrators are thinking about, right? Because this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. I can't give the same thing to Utah State that I give to Purdue, that I give to Florida State, that I give to a Division III school uh, in, in Massachusetts, right? So administrators and coaches are largely thinking about some of these issues as they implement their own parent education programs on their respective campuses. The second resource that we've created is a parenting guide, and this is really a best practices guide or manual for parents. For that parent who says, well, hey, I want to be involved, but I don't want to overstep my bounds. How can I do so? What's the best way to support my student athlete and allow them to be successful in that role? And again, just as an example, we offer parents the best ways to communicate how often, how much is the right communication with my student athlete. We also talk to parents about how best, if at all, to insert themselves into that athletic or that academic discussion. When might I need to come to my student's rescue and when might I need to let my student fail and figure it out on their own? So again, we're trying to offer parents just some best strategies as well as administrators, some step-by-step -step instructions on how best to deal with parents at the NCAA level. Now from this work and from our ongoing funded research with the NCAA, we're creating a web-based education portal uh, this fall for parents of incoming NCAA student athletes. And in this portal, we're using video interviews. Some of, some of you in back took part in those interviews. We're creating real life experiences for parents through these video interviews, through audio vignettes, through parent module quizzes, where we can actually dig deep into the idea of what does it mean to be a sport parent at the NCAA level. This site should go live sometime in December or January and we'll present our work uh, to the NCAA membership in January in Nashville. Now, I've spent the last five or ten minutes talking a lot about NCAA student athletes as the natural progression from being a youth and a high school athlete. But I think it's important for us and for you to recognize that that's just one path, and in fact, a minority path for young people who participate in sports. Indeed, it represents just about 2% of the 3 million high school athletes each year in the United States that are afforded the opportunity to go on and compete at Division I, II, III, or even NAIA schools across our country. 2%. So that leaves a forgotten 98% that really haven't been researched all that much. One of my graduate students who's in attendance today, Logan Lyons, is investigating some of these other pathways. Okay. So what is it about sport that when you transition into college might influence one's identity or one's trajectory of development. Now the first sort of neglected pathway here, and maybe you can't see that super well, is no college enrollment. So 15% of the 3 million high school athletes don't enroll in college. How do we find those people? How do we research those people? What are the mechanisms okay, by which they transition in identity from being a student and an athlete in high school to being neither? when they're 18 years old. Now the second, more ubiquitous pathway is disengagement from sport while matriculating in college. And that's about 83% of those three million high school athletes. And those 83%, you see, they have an interesting transition to make because for at least four years, but probably more like 10 or 12 years, their identity has been as one, at least one of their identities has been as an athlete. And now they're being asked to go to college and make all those transition points that I talked about earlier without having that huge chunk of who they are? How can parents help those individuals with that identity transition as well? So that's some of the future work that we're thinking about as well as we take a step uh, outside of the sport context. And that brings me very neatly to my final point today, and that is, how do we define success? We as a society and we as parents oftentimes talk about success as becoming elite, whatever that means, elite, okay? as earning that college scholarship, as playing professionally for money. But you see, when we define success this way, 98% of those high school athletes we talked about are going to fail. Okay? What if instead we define success as achieving all those developmental outcomes that we talked about earlier, that will serve the young people later in life when they go to become a CEO of a major corporation or they want to go to law school after their playing days. Or they want to become a professor. Learning leadership, 
teamwork, respect, and humility. These are but four values. I could, have, I, I could stand up here and talk for an hour about the values that we can impress upon our young people in sport. But these are four very important ones that I think are markers of success in youth sport. And you see, when we achieve these, to me, that's success. If we can craft a youth, a youth sport environment like this, to me, that's a marker of a positive outcome. That's the youth sport that will create stronger families. That's the youth sport that will create tomorrow's leaders. That's the youth sport that I envision. And that's the youth sport that together we can help create. As I wrap up today, I'd like to give many thanks to my collaborators and my students, many of whom are in attendance today that worked so diligently on the work that I've presented uh, herein. You can follow us on our lab website, www.usufamiliesinsportlab.com. It's a long one. I'll leave it up for a second. As well as on Twitter at Families in Sport. On behalf of my former self and my present self, I'd like to say thank you very much.